Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, my friends. How are you? I hope you're doing well. Thank you for joining us tonight on our top three list. I thought I'd do something different and do a video intro so you know exactly when we were going live instead of wondering when the page was going to come down and faces would start popping up. Uh, so again, thank you for being here. Tonight's stream is a top three nonfiction books, which dropped in 2022. And obviously, there's probably going to be a lot of uh, ones that don't make the top three, but we're still going to talk about because I have my good friend Keith Harris on, and he always has the books up and running. Keith, how are you, brother? I'm good, man. How's it going? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I hope uh, hope everything's been going well on the West Coast. You got through the cold spell that we all had. <laughs> yeah, we don't do that here. You know that, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. We, don't, we don't have that kind of we don't have that kind of problem. I think when we get down to 60 degrees, we all start complaining about how freezing it is. And then we turn on the news and just feel bad about ourselves. When we when we went to uh, Gettysburg together though, it was cold. Right? Yes, it was. This year. That was uh, that was the coldest I, I think I've been in a long time on the battlefield and I had the poor kids, you know, were freezing to death. Uh, that day, none of us came prepared. Us, Southern California city city people can't handle that kind of stuff, and you know, and it, and we were laughing, you know, and it started. Uh, I mean, it was like that was pretty serious, pretty serious stuff. The kids were all complaining, but they enjoyed it nonetheless. Yeah, it was it was a good time, and <laughs> it was it was. Hopefully, they uh, learned something from me and okay. <laughs> took something home. They still talk them. about that. They still talk about it. So that's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. Uh, but thank you again for being here, my friend. And I knew you were the guy to come to when we talk about these nonfiction books and uh, give, give everyone a little bit of background on your work online, especially with Instagram. Now you've been doing a lot more there and staying yeah. in that space. Uh, let everyone know about what you've been doing and, and how you've been doing. Yeah. Okay. Well, you know, um, social media wise, I've been pretty much focusing on, on Instagram these days. I dumped Twitter earlier this year. It, it got to be too much for me. So I just couldn't handle it anymore. So I bailed from that and started focusing on Instagram and on there. I've been doing a couple things. One of them is uh, focusing a lot on book reviews, primarily Civil War stuff, because that's my area of expertise, but not always. Just generally, uh, you know, any, anything that relates to American history is, is game as far as I'm concerned. And so if I get a hold of a book that I quite like, you know, I'll talk about it on Instagram and then maybe I'll, I'll review it on my website, uh, which is uh, uh, KeithHarrisHistory.com. So you can see all that stuff on over there. And recently, I've also been doing a lot of uh, what I'm calling history minutes or um, history help or whatever, just uh, just little short videos, minute and a half, two minute videos, uh, isolating a particular event or a particular thing or a particular document um, or a particular historical act or maybe even an idea or maybe even writing tips. And I'm focusing those towards students and teachers also um, of American history, you know, whether they be taking an A push course or, you know, a grade level history course or anything like that, uh, that helps them kind of think about history in different ways. Uh, one of the things that I talk about all the time uh, with my own students and with anybody who will listen really is that, you know, there isn't a singular narrative and there are lots of different perspectives and a lot of different positions on, uh, on change over time uh, and even continuity, continuity throughout history. And I think it's important for us to get all of those perspectives, um, kind of collect them all together uh, so we can best reconstruct a historical event, um, you know, uh, without a partisan angle or, or, right. or, or, or to try to be as objective as we possibly can, knowing that that, you know, real objectivity is, is I guess, impossible, but, you know, try to be as objective and, and step outside of our own worldview, uh, step outside of our own 21st century sensibilities and try to understand historical actors on their own terms, mm -hmm. uh, that sort of thing. And that's really what I've been focusing on in Instagram. It's it's really a, an educational uh, moment for me over there. Mm -hmm. and, and Instagram organic reach has been fantastic. So it's a good place to be right now. And, uh, as a person who does those video reviews and, and other things as well, but with as far as the books are concerned, uh, what do you think it takes to be a good book reviewer? Do you think that that idea of saying, hey, I need to extricate myself from my my way of life, so to speak, or my previous way of thinking, and to just go into this and see what I can find, that's the way to go? Or what do you think are some assets with book reviewers in general? Well, I, I can take a, a one. I can respond to that one way, kind of generally about book reviews, and, and and the second way I can respond to it is how I I approach book reviews specifically, because um, I have my own take on it a little bit. But the, for generally speaking, I think this is true for any book reviewer, is that <clears throat> the temptation is always to say, well, if I was writing this book, I would have said X, Y, and Z, and you didn't cover that, so you know clearly you've missed something. 
I don't think that that's a right way, to, right way to take a look at a, at a book. I think what you should do is look at what the author of the book is trying to say, what that person's argument is, and what evidence they used to support that argument. And, if, and so if, if the argument is successful. And if that's the case, then, you know, they've written a good, they've written a good book that makes us think about things. Um, you know, may even make us make uh, force us uh, or or compel us rather uh, to look beyond that book uh, for further information, for further reading on that. So that's a successful book, and and if an author can manage to do that, um, even if I you know don't necessarily agree with the author, if the author's managed to you know support an argument and compel me to look beyond that, then I think it's great. Now, personally, when I uh, when I write my book reviews, I also have an additional piece that I do is, 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 uh, is how I'm using the particular book in the classroom. Um, and so one of the things that I like to do uh, when I teach my history classes is to constantly bring new, uh, new research and new scholarship into the classroom so, so that kids, high school kids, can understand, it, even at that level, that history is a, you know, it's a, a dynamic discipline that's constantly evolving and changing you know, when we, when we find unearthed new evidence or, you know, ask different questions. And I want them to see that it's not just simply a textbook where we memorize a sequence of names and, and events as they unfold, you know, uh, you know, one after the other, memorize them, you know, and, and put that on, on a piece of paper somewhere. So they, they, as long as they understand that, you know, so I'll, if I read a book on environmental history, I'll, I'll you know, I'll, I'll bring that book in and, and, and focus a specific event and, and look at the environmental consequences of that event or something along those lines so they can see that there are a bunch of historians out there that focus on this particular thing uh and they go wow had no idea so i i I do that as well when i review books that's great that's great i know a few people who follow me are interested in reviewing for the first time Mm -hmm. uh they they want to get into it to to get the experience and to also beef up their cvs or resumes and and mainly get the experience and they want to know different ways to approach it. So that's that's great because they've they've never done it before. And it's kind of mm-hmm. like, oh, it's not like, you know, it's kind of like grad school, but it's not at the same time. <laughs> I mean, one of the helpful things about reviewing books is it, it helps to have a, a sort of working understanding of the historiography. So you can see where a book fits in things, you know, different whether it be a niche field or, or what, you know. You know, historians don't come up with this stuff out of thin air. I mean, we're building on the shoulders of giants. And so, you know, it, it helps to know if you can trace the history, the historiography back, you know, even to the 19th century, sometimes you can see what you, you can build upon that and see where the individual author fits, whether they're, you know, countering, uh, you know, uh, one particular position, one historiographical paradigm, or if they're adding to it and shifting away from it in, or, you know, in one way or the other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so it's certainly helpful to know that stuff. And Keith just said the word historiography, which <laughs> which uh, puts fear in the spine of every grad student I've ever been. Hey man, I teach you. I teach you in high school, man. I got a twelfth grade class, and we talk really? about it. It's um, you know, I'm trying to trying to get them ahead of the curve when they get to college, so they'll so they'll be well versed in some of these big historiographical shifts over the you know twentieth century into the twenty first. So they don't freeze like students like me did when we went to me too. Uh, first, first grad school class. I'm like, oh my god, I don't know what what's going on. <laughs> I, remember, I remember it well. I, I, I remember just like, you know, uh, my, my first two professors just handing me a stack of books, essentially, and saying, okay, understand these by the end of the week. And I was like, I don't know, I don't know what that is, man. Yeah, so want, I want to give, give my kids the advantage. Right. You, yeah. You want me to read two books a week? What is going on? <laughs> yeah. I remember those days. Speaking of books, uh, uh, we're going to get in our top three nonfiction books that dropped in 2022. I must say right off the top that we are not emboldened to any publishing house for tonight's thing. We, we get, we get books from different publishing houses throughout the, throughout the year. We are not here to like uh, stand firmly behind one or any other. Uh, so we are just going with our gut and how we feel about these certain books. And obviously the historiography behind the books uh, throughout our experience will impact um this as well. I, we have a we have a question though. I would like to get to. Uh, uh, so we're Seattle, my good friend Richard Keith. Yeah. Do you recommend that attitude when reading articles as well, as far as considering just what it is that the author used to back the argument? Yeah, totally. I, I can. I, I I take that attitude when I read pretty much anything. Um, you know, uh, it's just and, and scholarly articles are great because they're often 
framed, you know, specifically as historiographical pieces. And, you know, I, I like to see where these guys sit. I always read, I'm the guy that reads those big giant discursive footnotes. That's always like footnote number one or footnote number two, those big ones yeah. that take up half the page. Yeah. You know, I should drag out, you know, some, a journal over here or something like that. Cause those are always fun. You know, when the foot, when there's, when there's three lines of text and, you know, three quarters of a page of, of footnotes, I read the footnotes. Right. Um, because I'm, I'm kind of a historiography geek a little bit. And I, I really, you know, could spend just so much of my time studying that alone uh, mm. because it's so fascinating to me. Uh, but, yeah, but yeah, I, t I take that attitude whenever I read anything. And really, it's just I'm looking to see what is the author, what's the historian trying, trying what, what's the argument? What are they trying to tell me? What are they trying to teach me that, I, you know, that I need that I need to know that's that's new, it's fresh or it makes me think about things somewhat differently. Right. Right. Thank you for that question, Rich. Appreciate that. Please, everyone, go follow Civil War Seattle. He does some great work over there. Yeah, yeah for sure. Uh, on his pages and and has some great interviews as well. So there's pie. There's enough pie to go around for everybody. We're oh, not yeah. fighting over <laughs> real estate here. There's enough history to go around. For sure. So we help each other out. Uh, so as anyone who's watched our previous top three events knows, uh, myself and whoever else is on will uh, go from number three two number ones we go up our list so we're starting at the bronze and going up to gold uh for this particular list and keith and i offline said we definitely have a quite a few honorable mentions that we want to put out there as well between the rounds you and chat will be able to vote for uh, which pick you like the best nobody wins anything it's just for extra bragging rights and sometimes i get it and everyone says it's rigged and it's really not it's <laughs> but I'm, I'm thinking about cutting myself out of this <laughs> vote when I have two people on because then it's like, I don't want anything to do with this. I don't want to take from anybody. Uh, so Keith and I are going to go from number three, as I said, to number one, and we'll take breaks in between so that you all can vote and we can maybe do some honorable mentions between each round as well. So Keith, uh, yep. let's start at the bronze level this year, number three of 2022. Okay, so number three of 2022. And it, first of all, before I say anything, yeah. um, this is a tough one, right? And mm -hmm. so I had to, I, I picked three books that, I, that made me think about things in ways that I hadn't thought about them before. That's, uh, that's I think, the most successful mm -hmm. book. And three books also that I plan on using extensively uh, in my own coursework, in my classes on American history or in my classes on Civil War history. Um, so I'll start by saying my bronze, number three, mm -hmm. is a book by a new book just came out um, from uh, uh, NYU Press, Adam Mendelssohn, Jewish, uh, Jewish Soldiers in the Civil War. Um, and this is the, the one on the Union soldiers. The one on Confederate soldiers will be coming out very soon. Uh, this is a fantastic book. Um, it is based on a, a collection, a database. Uh, that's available online of all the Jewish soldiers that fought in the Civil War, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10,000 or so. Um, and I quite like it uh, in terms of uh, the historiography. It, it, it answers a number of questions that I think are very interesting uh, that, that go all the way back to the late 19th century when, um, when, when, when some scholars, uh, Jewish scholars, in response to the anti-Semitism that was going on uh, during that time, were sort of refuting all of that kind of thing, saying that no, uh, Jews, you know, the, 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 some of the anti-Semitic writings saying that Jews didn't participate in the war. Jews aren't patriotic. Jews, uh, you know, don't have the connection to American identity that, that you know, uh, that, that Christians uh, do. And they responded to that by saying, oh, no, of course we do. We're very patriotic. You know, and it was very hagiographic hey, in its tone, some of that late 19th century stuff. And it wasn't until the mid 20th century that people started to check some of that mm -hmm. uh, kind of thing. and began writing more nuanced pieces uh, about Jewish participation, uh, both in the North and in the South. Uh, uh, during the Civil War. And this in particular focuses specifically on men in the ranks. And it deals with questions about, you know, uh, the patriotism and nationalism uh, for union men, uh, dealing with things like region and variance and place of origin, you know, where, where their families had immigrated from in Europe, most specifically. Um, it talks about things like, you know, uh, the, the, what Jews had to deal with in terms of um, uh, keeping uh, Sabbath, keeping uh, Shabbat. Uh, it deals with um, ministers in the Union Army, uh, where the rules saying it had to be of a Christian denomination, and yet when, when Jews needed uh, religious attention, uh, spiritual guidance, uh, there were no rabbis available in the army, for example. Uh, things like that, which, so I think this is really interesting, and, is, and anybody who, who knows my work knows that I teach at a modern Orthodox Jewish high school in Los Angeles, and I have a 
an entire unit on Jews in the Civil War, and, and the kids always resonate with that, obviously. And uh, this book uh, is going to inform that discussion uh, in many ways. So that was my number two. So, so when you get to your Civil War unit in your mm -hmm. class, or when you get into it in class, is this going to be one that you provide for them as far as information out of it, or the book itself, uh, or portions of the book before, let's say, your big Gettysburg trip or your big trip east? Yeah, I take the trip east in uh, either April or May, uh, mm -hmm. depending on the holiday schedule. And um, this unit we usually do probably in February or March, and so we'll have that beforehand. Uh, but so that that would be specifically for my Civil War class. I do a whole Civil War and Reconstruction in American History course. It's the full year. Uh, we don't get quite as into it in my uh, in my U.S. History survey, which is a tenth grade class. This is a, my eleventh grade class, and we do like two or three weeks. Um, on the Jews in the Civil War unit. So I'm going to take the introduction of this book and some selected pieces from this book. And we also, we also read another um, collection of essays uh, edited by the same, same author. And then we read some of the stuff from the late 19th century, some of the more hagiographic hey stuff too, to give them a whole sweep uh, of the different kind of things that are going on. That's very cool. That's one that I have not read yet. So oh, I need to. That's I need good. To and, and, and they promised to put out a, a follow-up, a companion piece to this. That talks about the Confederates oh, wow. uh, as well. This is this is the Union volume, so I'm thinking next year the Confederate volume is going to come out too. Wow, that'll be that'll be a set to have. Then I'm going yep, to for sure grab that one. And since you picked it, I know it's good. So <laughs> he's a man. He's yeah, that, a man that, is, that is an endorsement, right? That's he's an a, endorsement. He is a man of taste, my friend. <laughs> uh, so um, we're going to stick with mid 19th century for my first for first pick here. Mm -hmm. uh, so you picked a Civil War book. I have a mid-19th century book. goes into the American Civil War as well uh, by UNC Press, brought out by UNC Press. I forget what month in 2022 it came out. But uh, my number three choice is uh, Stephen Barry's Count the Dead, Coroners, Quants, and the Birth of Death as We Know It. Um, as many of you know, I'm big into uh, trying to understand memory, historical memory mixed with historical trauma uh, and, and, and death and the idea of a good death and stuff that we hear about in the mid 19th century. So when I received this book, I was like, well, this is right in my wheelhouse. So I want to check this out and see what Stephen Barry has to say. Uh, I've met Stephen Barry and heard him talk. He's great, great person. Uh, this is a very thin book as well. So mm -hmm. me having to go through grad school, I, I read this in like less than a day because I still had that grad school, like two books a week kind of thing when they're like this thick. Mm -hmm. um, but what mm -hmm. he uses in this is a lot of uh, quantitative data to go into the archives and the records to find out how different societies dealt with basically mass trauma on a health scale and uh, as well as conflict, as we'll see in the mid 19th century America. Uh, so they they have a couple of passages, passages in there which concern the idea of using more quantitative data to uh, understand society as a whole. And I think this is a fantastic thing because sometimes early on in my graduate school, we didn't really go over what the difference is between quantitative and qualitative data and how do we use it. Uh, they actually say the point of this book is simple. If you want to measure how a state is actually doing, don't watch the news, watch the morgues. Yeah. And it's a really in-depth kind of understanding of death and memory in a different way and trauma and how we uh, perceive it throughout history and how we perceive our ancestors going through these kinds of things. So it's, it talks about the National Death Registration that w that took place in England in the mid 19th century. We kind of adopted something similar later on, uh, where we try to understand why these mass casualty events are happening, uh, especially with with uh, you know you have tuberculosis everywhere, you have smallpox outbreaks, yellow fever, and uh, the different tragedies, how it impacts how we see society as a whole and societies in the past. And it's very easy to read. It's a good read. Uh, as I said, it's not a, a long read, but the detail within it is so good. And me 
basically diving into this kind of a subject matter very often when I go to visit a battlefield or go to visit a, a place where there has been a, a mass trauma event. It's, it's a book like this that's going to allow people like me to say, okay, well, we can use this model as far as quantitative data or, or, or going back and reading the death registries to understand what actually happened here and how it impacted society as a whole. So uh, obviously how we see mass casualty events has changed in the last couple of years mm -hmm. because we've lived through another one. Uh, but in a hundred years, someone is going to use our records to just, to, just like we use the ones for the 1919 pandemic. And uh, I think a book like this really helps bring that home. Yeah, I, I, you know, I really like that book. Um, uh, and uh, I, I did, I, I appreciated that it was a, a fairly quick read. Um, complex but not but 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 complex but accessible which i thought was mm -hmm. nice you know a lot of times that you know uh scholarly works can be inaccessible to the general public and so i always appreciate a book that the general public can absorb um and understand you know not not that the historians are dumbing anything down they're absolutely not but they're they're using the language that's available uh to mm -hmm. to the informed public i like to say but i but i like this book a lot stephen barry who's done wonderful work in gender history also um, what I found interesting about this book is he kind of makes a case for the value of bureaucracies, you know, right. which is something that, you know, kind of when I, you know, oh man, you hear that word and you're like, oh, you know, here comes like complication and unnecessary, you know, density yeah. and all this kind of stuff that, you know, okay, whatever. but, uh, but no, he kind of makes a case for it. And, and I found that, that, that pretty, that pretty interesting. I was skeptical at first when he began talking about that, but then once I read through, I go, yeah, you know, he's he makes some pretty, he makes some pretty good points on that stuff. So yeah, I, yeah. When we got to that part too, I was like, "Oh, okay. Well, let's yeah. see where let's see where this road's going to go." And yeah. uh, and I think it would be an interesting interview, mm -hmm. to say the least, with with having this coming out right as the uh, for many people the pandemic ends, even mm -hmm. though it's an endemic now, and and we can argue back and forth about that and on a different live stream. But the the idea of living through what we just lived through, mm -hmm. I think, can change a lot of people's ideas about these mass casualty situations and bureaucracies and and how we perceive the data sets you know so sure. it's timely <laughs> it is i mean it really is no you're absolutely right about that so i am going to put a poll question up in the poll or in the poll in the chat mm -hmm. and uh we're going to see what people think of our choices keith do you have uh a honorable mention you would like to give while yeah. people or I know you have a stack and I want to make sure you have enough for because <laughs> I don't think I do but I know you might well since okay since you were talking about you know uh, trauma and various other things I want to right. as an honorable mention uh talk about Stephen Cowie's new book from uh Sava Speedy uh when hell came to Sharpsburg uh this oh, is get, make sure to glare off the light this is there we go this is a, a fantastic a uh, really fantastic book um, that I that I very much uh, enjoyed. It's a, really an environmental history of the Battle of Antietam, and it discusses uh, discusses what happens. And this is something I talk to my students about all the time because they don't think about this really. You know, when armies that were the size of the Army of the Potomac in in, in the Army of Northern Virginia, even the you know kind of the reduced version of the Army of Northern Virginia that invaded Maryland in 1862, but when you look at the numbers. The sheer numbers of people that, that sort of converge on Sharpsburg, Maryland, you know, uh, in, in, in mid-September and then uh, Confederates leave and the Army of the Potomac stays around for a few weeks. When you think about the numbers of men, tens of thousands of men and all of their horses, you know, what kind of effects does that have on the environment, on the population? It's just astronomical when you start to think about that they chop down all the trees for firewood, they burn up all the fence rails, they burn down all the they burn up all the barns for firewood, they drink all the wells dry, they eat everything that they can find, all the animals, they uh, they they all go to the bathroom and, and all that you know into the water supply, uh, and and yeah, and then they 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 leave their dead behind and dead horses and all the things that takes place when that I mean it's just devastating. I mean, absolutely devastating to the environment that would have repercussions for years and years and years to come. Um, and that's something you don't really think about when you read about these battles and then, you know, the armies go off to some other place. But you have to remember, you know, and, and what they leave behind, you know, mm -hmm. some of these communities, I think, never really fully recover. And the civilian populations get the diseases that the Civil War soldiers bring with them and what, and what goes down. So when you talk about trauma, 
on a massive scale, you know, you have to look beyond even the fighting itself. Sometimes, you know, you have to look beyond that and see what uh, see what goes after. So that that's one of my mm -hmm. honorable mentions mm -hmm. uh, when hell came to Sharpsburg. Really like that book. I, I haven't read that one either just yet, but I've heard great things about it. And yeah, I cool. have really gotten into environmental histories mm -hmm. lately uh, within the last couple of years, uh, starting with Megan Kate Nelson's book years ago. But then there was a little bit of a gap. And then Ken No came out with one and mm -hmm. a couple others came out with some. And that really uh, intrigued me to be a little bit different than what other people were doing, because I'm always trying to be a little different than what other other people in my area are, are trying to do. And I'm like, oh, let's talk about environmental history. For real. And, yeah. Megan's uh, book, uh, Megan's book was great. Ruined Nation. That was a wonderful book. Yeah. Yeah. That was a fantastic book. Mm -hmm. And uh, going along that line, I'll do my honorable mention while everyone is finishing up with the uh, the, the poll question, even though Keith is running away with, with the first round, which is awesome because I don't want it to look rigged. I don't want it to look rigged. Thank you, everybody, for not making it look that way. Although we have 20 people in here and only six of you have voted. So I know you're from America because 20 of you are registered to vote and only six of you have voted. Right. That sounds about that sounds about we just had our mayoral elections here in Los Angeles. I think we got like a like a 23 or 24. It was 23 or 24 percent turnout for the vote and this is like i mean a really important election if you've been to la recently you know the city is falling apart right uh and the, whoever's you know the, the person leading us now and we'll see what happens but right. uh yeah it was really surprising to me how few people turned out uh, for that election wow. it's remarkable uh christopher in chat welcome in uh the antietam book sounds awesome we see impacts of war on citizens in ukraine for example but somehow we forget that these armies had huge impacts on communities mm -hmm. thank you for that honorable mention yeah. Yeah. That is so true. That is so true. <clears throat> uh, the one that I want to do an honorable mention is kind of like piggybacking off of yours with environmental and post battle history. And I did a review of this for the army history journal slash mag. Uh, and this was a James Gindelsperger's bullets and bandages, mm. uh, the aid stations and field hospitals at Gettysburg. Uh, if you're into the old Frazanito books, and stuff like that, where it was like, hey, this happened on this spot, and here's a modern shot of where this location is. You're going to like this book uh, because you can literally get the coordinates and the uh, and and put in your GPS, and you can go not only to field hospitals but to aid stations, which is part of the Letterman way of doing things in the medical history of the Civil War. And I've always been interested in that because of the the, the trace of battle and, and again, going back to trauma and and post battle stuff. Uh, I wanted to rebel against the people who said and the armies moved away. And that was the end of the story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and everything's beautiful and pristine. Uh, so uh, Gindelsperger does a great job. The one the one thing that I really liked also uh, the aid stations and field hospitals at Gaysburg is the, the uh, title underneath there. The one thing I also liked was he actually took the initial locations or the field hospital locations and connected the doctors to that. So you have a list of the doctors who were there, if he could find them, uh, the different core that were in each one. And it's really, really a detailed manuscript in that way. And uh, it was uh, done by Blair out of North Carolina. And uh, thank you to Army Press for sending that to me, allowing me to... Uh, to uh review that but it was fantastic and a guy like me who likes to take fresnito's books out on the battlefield and see the mm -hmm. original locations it's kind of the same same vein uh with that one so with uh 12 votes in keith gets 67 percent of the vote there you go round one i should, I should get a, a muffin basket or something i'm telling you, you. I'm telling you. I, it's like i said nobody nobody these it's like whose line is it anyway it's mm -hmm. kind of like the points don't matter it's kind yeah. of like you know maybe that's why people don't vote i don't know okay. they're like oh what's this vote i'm going to put this on my cv though i'm you I'm should good that i want oh this goes on mine yeah. <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> my live streams are going on my resume yeah, it's my I mean, 12 page it's my as well page win, man uh so uh number three pick is finalized it is, in, it is in so now let us go on to the silver we're going on to the number two pick go okay. ahead keith all right here we go so number two for me is uh new who is it from um liverpool this is carrie greenage's new book the grim keys it just came out 
um, an, ex, an outstanding book, The Subtitle, The Legacy of Slavery in an American Family. This, I, I, I'm almost all of the way completely through this book. Um, I'm still working on some other things. I mean, I've read it, but I'm, I'm working on some other stuff, some details on the book. And, and I quite like it uh, because it complicates the story of reformers. Um, and talking about uh, the, the Grimke sisters, of course, which is, I'm sure you know, and everybody knows that they were very famous uh, uh, daughters of a, of a, of a plantation, South Carolina plantation holder, and they rejected all of that and, you know, and, and became uh, very prominent abolitionists. So they kind of go against the mole. They are uh, women of great privilege and who, you know, grew up in this environment and then um, rejected it and became abolitionists. But of course, the, the complications of that are what I found uh, especially interesting. The, the progressive reformers of the 19th century can often take on these sort of paternalistic uh, uh, positions. They can be condescending. They can, you know, they can uh, advocate for one thing. They talk about abolition in, in terms of how it affects uh, white people uh, more often than they talk about slavery and how it affects black people. Hmm. Um, and so it just, it muddies the waters quite a bit uh, when we talk about reform movements in the 19th century. And it, you know, it complicates the story of the Grim Grimkeys talking about not just the Grimsky sisters, but also the black descendants of that family. Uh, who are products of, uh, of, of, of you know, rape and, and various other things that were going on uh, uh, in, in the plantation system. And so uh, all the descendants of, uh, of that family and how they intersect in, in very interesting ways, all the different relations. Uh, so I, I found the book absolutely fascinating. And I just, uh, anything to me that, that, that complicates a story that we think we understood um, and humanizes people because, you know, the thing about the Grimkeys is we often tend to put these folks up on a pedestal as these are, as our great heroes. And, and without question, they have a number of virtues, uh, for sure, but they're still human beings and human beings like everyone are flawed. Um, and so it's interesting to see how their takes on, uh, the anti-slavery movement, uh, kind of unfold over their lifetime and over their descendants lifetime. And it's also interesting to see how, you know, they, they think of, uh, of black people in the United States, um, as it seems to me that are taking on some of the, 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 the sensibilities of, of most 19th century white people, suggesting that blacks are somehow intellectually or even morally inferior, that mm -hmm. they're uh, like children that need to be looked after in many cases. And so it all comes through in that book in, in very interesting ways. Um, and that they never seem to really come to terms with that they're in a, such a, a particular privileged position that because they're, they're, they're in that position because of their roots in the slave system, which I think is very interesting too. So this book really complicates the story and I'm looking forward to bringing some of these things up with my um, with my 10th grade US history class to talk when we're talking about reform, in fact, next week. Um, and, and so when we're talking about reform, we're gonna complicate that story by looking at how different reformers approached uh, some of these things. That's awesome. That's awesome. And who, who put that book out? What publisher? This is, um, hold on, I, put, I keep my glasses off because <laughs> of that my glare it, yeah it makes me look psychotic uh but let, <laughs> <laughs> hold on let's uh, this is um is this the main publisher here hold on i'm sorry i'm sorry i'm sorry no, you're uh, fine. This, this is this is norton of course this is liver right publishing but it's a division of norton ww norton oh, nice. nice right so that's uh, awesome thanks my friends at norton for that one there you go it, it's the one perk well one of many perks, I, in my opinion, of being a historian, you know, you're not, you get to work on things you're passionate about, you get to study things you're passionate about, but the free books now and then are nice. <laughs> it's nice. It is nice for perk. And then you get to like pass them on to other people, mm -hmm. hopefully, because I don't want to move them for the third time in like three years. So yeah, it, at least two of my honorable mentions tonight are out. Uh, if we get to them mm -hmm. are out on loan with students, because I do it all the time. If they're all of my students from the 10th, 10th grade on, they all work on year long research papers. And so right. I have kind of a lending library of sorts, you know, for certain books, some, some of the books I don't let out, out of my sight, but for, you know, for a lot of my books, I, I give them to students and they use them uh, for their research papers. So nice. Throughout. Yeah. Nice. We, we have a, uh, we have a fan of the book that you just mentioned, the Scorpion mm -hmm. doll. Welcome in uh, history with her. Go follow history with her as well. Oh please. yeah, for sure. Very uh, cool. That's a great, that's a great, that's a great Instagram. Uh, yeah. Page, by the way. Uh, also love that we meet many of our reformers, both black and white in this book. Mm -hmm. Very good. Very cool. Yes. Please go follow history with her over there. See, everybody's showing up. It's great. Hey, this is what it's about. 
It's about making community here. Yep, <laughs> community of nerds. This is fantastic. <laughs> I'm all about this life. Uh, so uh, I got to go with number. I got to get my number two ready here. There we go. Um, this one I just received last week. So this is a late 2022 acquisition, and it's already on my top three list. Uh, was that a cat I heard? Yeah, that's my cat Hooter. I, I didn't know it was yours likes, or mine. <laughs> no, no, that's mine. Hooter is uh, has has uh, has has gotten into this habit of uh, screaming for no apparent reason, oh. uh, which is always you know pleasurable, especially at three o'clock in the morning. But it, <laughs> hopefully, I'm hoping it's just a phase. Really, that's been going on for a few months now. No, oh. he'll, he'll shut up. In that's minute, interesting. So. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. <laughs> <laughs> okay, <laughs> you'll, you'll say it's a phase. I'll say it's a phase. <laughs> Uh, as I said, uh, that uh, I just received this book like last week or week before. I am reviewing it, but I'm not. Uh, I haven't written it yet. It is put out by Potomac Books, University of Nebraska Press. It is by Stephen Dundas or Dundas. I'm sorry, Stephen, if I'm getting this wrong. Mine eyes have seen the glory, religion, mm-hmm. and the politics of race in the Civil War era and beyond. Is my second pick. Now, some people will uh, not. How should I say this? Some people will not like the book in the fact that he is very brash. He is very open about uh, a lot of things involving religion and uh, uh, race in the American Civil War period and beyond. He is a a former chaplain, so uh, he would know more about it than I do. And and, uh, but he's very straightforward. He says in the introduction, I don't have a PhD. I'm not trained in this, but this is uh, what I have learned over the years as far as religion, politics, and race of uh, the Civil War period and forward. And he really lays out what I would consider a good popular history book, a very readable book for people to connect the dots between, let's say, the the Civil War, the antebellum period, and uh, what happens in Reconstruction with race and how religion is twisted into whatever narrative it needs to be used to make things work. Uh, in fact, there was a great line in it and I posted it the other day and I don't know if I could find it or not, but he says about how uh, some of the preachers in the South in the antebellum period were some of the greatest proponents of slavery simply because the enslavers were in their pews. And it's the people who were funding the churches and they had to make this work for their needs and such. So there are some instances where some people may be, um, you know, not uh, too thrilled about the things he says in there, but that's why we don't usually argue politics and religion with friends. Uh, but And he covers both in this one. Uh, there are some great anecdotes in here about the USCT troops in the field, what they are considering as the things they are fighting for, what freedom is to them and how they connect their path forward to their religious beliefs, whichever way they may lean uh, in the religious belief category. As I said, it's very readable. It's very uh, brutally honest about the institution of chattel slavery. There's no skirting around the issue at all in the book. Mm -hmm. Uh, He calls out those who have for years uh, uh, preached the lost cause uh, and have uh, really, especially in the 1990s, 1980s, we saw that uh, climb to new heights due to uh, certain media, which came out Mm -hmm. that really uh, allowed that to keep going. We had textbooks that were propagating this myth and uh, he, he, doesn't mention people by name, obviously, but he's kind of saying these organizations were pushing these things and they believed in it uh, wholeheartedly. And this is why we need to come out of the shadows of this kind of thing and move forward and make history more accessible uh, to a broader range of people. So I appreciate him for that. And uh, I really did enjoy the book. I just finished it. Uh, and then, like I said, it's very reasonable. It's out by University of Nebraska Press. And it's one of those where I think in our times, especially when we are having uh, these debates about what should be taught in the classroom and what shouldn't be taught and how it should be taught and everything else going on, 
that this book really is timely. And uh, I think that's also why it's on my top three is because I like the timeliness of this work. So that's my number two pick for this one. All right. That sounds, that sounds, that sounds rad. That's something I, uh, that's a book that I haven't read yet that now, of course I want to. Aha. So, I got one that you didn't <laughs> read because <laughs> you've gotten two on me. <laughs> and I'm like, Come on. What is going on? People are going to think I don't read anything. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, that, that was a, that was a good one. I, I do a, I do appreciate when people just lay it out there on the line and especially me growing up in a lost cause environment mm -hmm. uh, where I was reenacting and it was very heavily infected, if you will, with lost cause ideas and, and dare I say racist ideas. Um, when you're, when you're trying to come to terms with what you've experienced and the things that you probably well you did uh say wrong 20 years ago or 25 mm -hmm. years ago sometimes you need that brutal honesty and uh that, you know that's just one of those things where if i see it i love it and i want people to uh point it out when they see it so well, you know i think it's important especially when it comes to the lost cause that we look at ourselves in the mirror sometimes i mean you know i grew up in the same kind of environment and when i was in alabama uh, as a kid i mean my textbooks were you know pretty straight ahead lost cause stuff and it was you know just kind of taken for granted that was the story right you know and it wasn't until <clears throat> i started reading this stuff myself and started asking questions when i was in when i was a teenager i've been doing this for a long time now but when i was a teenager I started asking questions about this stuff because the the mythology didn't seem to align with a lot of the history that i was reading um now of course the lost causers will say well you just been indoctrinated by <laughs> by a bunch yeah. of Yankees, but I know those were some, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but but no, I mean, you know, it's like reading real, uh, re real scholarship on this stuff, you know, based on evidence and, and extensive research. And some of the questions that I started asking, you know, led me down some paths to, to show me that, you know, it, but it was my own doing, you know, and I think it takes that, you know, you, I think it's important for anybody reading history to always be critical of the stuff you're reading. Mm -hmm. I mean, no matter what it is, sure, um, you know, ask the questions. Anything that's published, I think, is open for criticism. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's important that we that we take it upon ourselves to ask those questions and to go and look at, you know, here we go again with the footnotes, but go look at the footnotes and see where yeah. they got, you know, what, what evidence they're drawing from to support their arguments. If they don't have any, you know, then, well, things get a little tough. Yeah, I knew that we were kindred spirits when I realized we both love bibliographies. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, sometimes that's the first thing I turn to. I swear. Yeah. You know, first, yeah. you know, I always turn to the bibliography to see what's going on, see where they're coming from. You can yeah. learn so much by reading a, 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 you know, a historian's bibliography. Yeah, you can almost tell the direction you're going to go just by mm -hmm. looking at the bibliography. You can, you can start to feel it, like, okay, I know where we're heading here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can certainly you know. get some ideas. That's for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, everyone, the poll question is up right now. It's only been up for a minute, so please uh, go vote if you would. We have nine votes in this time. We are increasing our vote uh, ratio getting, here. Things are getting serious. Way to go, people. Mm -hmm. uh, way to go, everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, do you have another one, Keith, that you would like to do an honorable mention? Oh, yeah. Yeah, honorable mention. Uh, here we go. This is, and, I'm gonna pro I, and, I, and I apologize to, to the author because I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to butcher the name, I'm sure. Maurizio Vassania. Uh, new book, George. Uh, first called First Among Men. Uh, it's George Washington and the Myths. We're going to this and the Myth of American Masculinity. This is a, a great book. This is new from Johns Hopkins uh, University Press, and it takes on a lot of ideas about manhood and George Washington. And uh, the, wow. what I what I very much enjoyed about that is looking at it in two ways. One is a gender history, and one is a memory history because. A lot of the things that we get about the masculinity of George Washington, you know, this sort of towering figure, um, you know, with broad shoulders and, you know, everything that is so manly about this guy, you know, and sort of that, that kind of uh, almost a, a caricatured version of manliness that we see in George Washington, the images of George Washington, all that it really is an invention of the next century. That's a 19th century version of George Washington and really the man himself. Hardly resembled anything. Hardly resembled this this image that we that that nineteenth century writers created of this incredibly strong, incredibly robust, virile, uh, you know, uh, guy that it wasn't really like that at all. And it just kind of gives you. It helps us understand that that the the uh, manhood is defined over centuries in many different ways. And so when we're reading about this stuff, we have to the George Washington that we grew up on with the stories as kids. 
is hardly the George Washington that actually existed, a very different man. So um, I think it was uh, it's really great and something I would talk about in my own classes, you know, when we talk about understanding manhood or understanding womanhood or understanding anything in relation to gender history is that we have to understand them on their terms, mm -hmm. not on somebody mm -hmm. else's. If we try to understand it on somebody else's terms, we're going to get it wrong mm -hmm. uh, every time, you know, and that's, right. uh, you know, that's true for 19th century authors trying to make something bigger than George Washington they actually was. Right. Yeah, he did not carry an AR-15 and drive a Dodge Charger. No, no, he didn't. No. <laughs> you know? he, did. he was he come down in a in a Black Hawk helicopter. You know. Yeah. And yeah. Nothing like that. Yeah, you know, I like to think because I drive a Ford Fiesta, I'm mm -hmm. more like him. It wasn't a pickup tr truck kind of guy. You know? <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's all about that small car, people. You know. Yeah. Um, I'll do an honorable mention too before we wrap up round two uh 13 votes in amazing we only have six that haven't voted this is a great poll question here uh ethan uh, ethan zook in the chat Thank, i'm glad we, we are ethan <laughs> you're shattering my american myth gentlemen that's great yeah sorry <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah this is great um i'm, I'm going to go with a, another book that was presented to me about two months ago that i got in the mail and I really enjoy it because I know this part of the world. Uh, I've spent time there on vacation, and it's by uh, Caroline Grego, and it is Hurricane Jim Crow, mm. the great Sea Island Storm of 1893 and how it shaped the Low Country South. I've spent a lot of time in the Low Country since I was a kid. We had a friend who lived in North Charleston for many years. Mm -hmm. And uh, this goes right to the heart of some of the uh, issues that we see in the Jim Crow South taking place after the storm, uh, before the storm, we, she introduces us to life in the low country, but then how the storm impacts and is used to the advantage of white Southerners to take back land, to take back power from those who they perceive as having too much power over mm -hmm. the years. Uh, the Red Cross gets involved in this book. Clara Barton arrives on the scene and she gets in the middle of everything. And so you'll find out what Clara Barton does uh, there and uh, how she's a thorn in the side to uh, both sides at certain points in particular. And uh, it's not a very good cut and dry kind of story with the Red Cross uh, down there as a whole. But I enjoyed it because uh, also... Uh, I grew up as like a seven, eight year old when I was first getting to history and I studied disasters. And so it was hurricanes and stuff like that. And a lot of young, young people do follow that track where like, I want to learn about Pompeii or the San Francisco earthquake. And it's the Titanic for me. The Titanic. So, yeah. Yeah. Same for me. I was the same way. Mm -hmm. Well before the movie people. Mm -hmm. Well before yeah, the movie. Before the movie. <laughs> way before the movie. Before yeah. The We're talking 1980s for me. Mm -hmm. Um, so it, it was like in my wheelhouse because it's about a disaster, but it's not just the disaster and the basically environmental history in here as well. It's about how that is used to the advantage of those who want to take power back for themselves uh, 30 years after the end of the Civil War. So I really appreciated that. And now I look at the low country a little bit differently and so if i ever get back down there i'm going to see things in a different way uh, not in a negative way but just like okay now i understand why things are uh certain ways down there so that's uh again hurricane jim crow uh caroline grego uh, that is also a, a unc press book so if you're into that kind of thing that might be in your wheelhouse Do a little post-civil war stuff there sounds fantastic so, uh, 13 votes in, we're going to call it, um, uh, I got 54% of that one. Oh, so nice. That was pretty have, even uh, split though. Yeah. 54, 46. So, uh, good. so we are one and one. We, All we, right. We, we got this. This will be the tiebreaker. This will be round. Oh, I'm very excited. You know, this is, yeah. I'm, this is going to be a good one. So go ahead, my friend. All right. Here we go. Number one. Yeah. Drum roll. Drum so, roll. uh, a little background since I, I came up uh in uh in in the world uh studying military history i was trained by a military historian spent a lot of times talking about military history i no longer think of myself i don't really think of myself as a military historian but i think military history is extraordinarily important um you know talking about the civil war you know a 
lot of times people criticize me for talking too much about combat, about battles, about soldiers, about generals, about tactics, about strategy, and all those kinds of things. They say, oh, you're, you're, you know, you're giving too much to the, to the, to the military side of things. And I respond by saying, well, I mean, you know, there's a war going on. So maybe it's, uh, in, maybe it's worthwhile knowing about these sorts of things. And so my number one pick is a military history book uh, by Jeffrey Wirt, uh, The Heart of Hell, The Soldier's Struggle for Spotsylvania's Bloody Angle. Uh, yes. Fantastic book. This is UNC Press. It's, uh, it's a really wonderful piece. Um, loved it because it is a firsthand, uh, the, the, the majority of the, of the research here is firsthand accounts by soldiers who fought uh, at the Muleshoe uh, salient there at Spotsylvania Courthouse. Um, and it is what I, what I found fascinating about this book is that it, it is graphic in its description of the combat itself, which is extraordinarily unusual because soldiers didn't tend to speak about that sort of thing, really, all that much, um, to anybody other than other soldiers. And so if they're writing letters to their folks at home, they're not talking about, you know, the, the graphic, the gory details of, of combat so much. And, and I think that, 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 that word has come up with enough uh, to put together an entire book on this that, that talks about, you know, the, the, the actual combat is, is, is fascinating. And, and I think that it does a lot to paint a picture of what that was really like. Um, which it's a, for, for a person who's never served in the military, never served, never seen any kind of combat, and you know, obviously I wasn't around the 19th century, to imagine what that was like is difficult. And I think books like this help us, and it, and it sort of, you know, it humanizes that. Um, you can see, you know, real people and real descriptions of their, their fears and, you know, their reactions to things. And uh, I just found this book wonderful. I, I think he's done a wonderful job at it, and I recommend it for anyone. Word is a fantastic author. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's been, I mean, he's one of the, he's one of the, the sort of, you know, great Civil War historians, military historians. Yeah, yeah. It, he's one of those that I can always read and mm -hmm. it's very readable for a lot of people. I mean, it's, yeah, totally. It's another one of those books that's extraordinarily accessible, which, you know, right. I always tend to lean towards those. And, and, you know, I mean, I know that uh, one of my, uh, Honorable Mentions is a book that isn't particularly accessible to the general public, but it's still a good book um, if, we, if we get to those. But, but mm -hmm. no, I, I always lean towards the more accessible stuff. I think, mm -hmm. it's, uh, I think it's important that, you know, at least some historians try to reach a broader audience like that. Right. Yeah. Especially in this age when I still hear some students who contact me and say, I don't think history is as accessible as it should be. Mm -hmm. And I see the costs of some of the things and it's like, yeah, I can understand that because I still can't afford to go to conferences. So mm -hmm. it's one of those things I, I totally get it. So if we can make it more accessible either through word or act, I think it's the heart of the matter. Yeah. We're on the same page there, my friend. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. So, uh, I'm going to take us out of the 19th century and uh, I'm going to take us up into the 20th century with my last, my last book. And uh, this one is from an author who is a very readable author as well. So our books this evening are going to be very readable for any mm -hmm. audience or most audiences, especially mm -hmm. if you uh, love history like we do. And I'm sure many of you do. Um, I've read most of his books. I haven't read them all. I think he's got closing in on 14 books or something like that. Uh, forgive me if I'm wrong, Tim. Sorry. Lifesavers and Body Snatchers. Tim Cook, the the man, the legend, uh, my, one of the premier uh, Canadian military historians. Uh, this book just came out uh, middle of the year, I believe. and uh, don't let the don't let that like <laughs> you know hurt you at all it is very readable it's big print so i thank you for that because i didn't need my reading glasses mm -hmm. with this book um but there's been a myth for years or or i shouldn't say a myth there's been an old wives tale for years in canada that during the first world war uh when those who were killed in action had their bodies removed from the battlefield that they were actually harvesting uh, organs from organs and pieces of the body for medical purposes mm -hmm. and uh, study. And for years, people had heard this, but there was no official record from the military saying, yes, we did this or no official word. It was kind of like, uh, you know, just a thing that was passed down and, and people always wondered it. 
And then Tim stumbled into the archives and found the information that mm -hmm. it's true. Uh, so what we have in Lifesavers and Body Snatchers is a story, is a medical history of the First World War from the Canadian aspect of things. They are working hand in hand, obviously, with the British uh, and the other crown forces of the Commonwealth. And we see nobody is prepared for what they are going to see, obviously, not just in weaponry, but in medical history. And then they wish to study the effects of that type of conflict or combat, excuse me, on the human body. And to do that, they have to take pieces of the body which have been infected with the gas and gas warfare, uh, obviously pieces of the body which have been traumatized by warfare. Uh, so many of the Canadians, even to this day, did not know that perhaps part of their ancestor was used in medical experimentation uh, with research or anything like that. And they are first finding out in Tim Cook's book that it is true. And uh, this is going to be a unique moment in historical memory of the First World War for many Canadian families, because there may always be that question of what it was my ancestor, one of those that had a piece of their body sent to this medical school or not. Uh, remember, we have a place like this in the United States. We, we have a place where you could go see bones from Antietam and Gettysburg and, and our places. You can see Sickles Leg and all that. Well, one of the people who was one of the main proponents of this move uh, at the time had actually visited that location in, in D.C. area and said, hey, the Americans have this to study uh, wounds from war. We should probably think about trying to do the same ourselves. And that's how the ball gets rolling. And we now have to question what all happened with some of the bodies of those who now lay in Commonwealth war graves in Europe. And Tim Roy lays it out there in a way that allows you to understand the medical background without needing to have a medical background. And then the ideas of the schools and how that impacts Canadian health care history going forward. Because remember, we have the First World War and then we have the, the, the pandemic, which overlaps the end of the First World War. And that heavily impacts the idea of creating the Canadian idea of socialized medicine. So we're, we're going in that vein when we look at lifesavers and body snatchers. But again, Tim is one of the premier Canadian military historians, and he makes these works for the people. So they're not over your head. So don't think of it as just like tactics and numbers. It's really the heart of the matter and really personal stories. So you're going to want to check this one out, I believe, if you're into First World War history or medical history. That sounds great. So that's my gold star for <laughs> for for this year, and it's not because he's a friend. It's, it's got, <clears throat> no, we've got some yeah. winners here. These are these are all all sound like fantastic books. Yeah, yeah, we we have quite a mix here, which yeah, I really. which I enjoy. Uh, chat, let us know what you think about all the different variety we have here. Uh, I'm sure there's some people in chat who also have some that some people in chat would like to share with us. Uh, honorable mentions as well. Sorry, I'm going off of the side of my chair here no, <laughs> doing stuff. Okay. I have books all over the floor. Uh, what, other, what other ones would you like to announce? Uh, Keith? Okay, I got one other honorable mention for sure. Um, okay. I have my glasses over here. Uh, and this is one of the books that I've lent out, so I, I have a photograph of it on my phone for... Um, uh, for for my review purposes that I'll be pu publishing this review in the next couple of days. It's called Conservative Thought in American Constitutionalism Since the New Deal uh, by Jonathan O'Neill. This is also from Johns Hopkins. Um, really super interesting book that, that takes on uh, really, if anything, federalism and the, the nature of the relationship between the federal government and its constituent parts, the various states. And, and it traces the conservative thinking about uh, about the growth of the federal government and the power of the federal government, really going back to the Lincoln administration, but looking at the Lincoln administration and the Wilson administration uh, the, during the progressive era, and then focusing primarily on the, the monumental changes that take place in that relationship during the New Deal under Roosevelt's administration, uh, and then taking that forward uh, to the Great Society also. 
and he looks at conservatism not as uh, as as sort of reactionary atavism, but but as an intellectual movement uh, that counters uh, the growth of the federal government um, and the power of the federal government and the federal government's ability to reach into the lives of ordinary people. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the intellectual move, uh, the, the conservative intellectual movement that counters all of that kind of stuff. Uh, from primarily the book focuses from the 1930s to the 1960s, but but it does trace it back to Lincoln administration and Wilson as well. Uh, so a book that I very much uh, very much like, and I think it's also a timely book now that we're talking about these sorts of things. You read about this kind of stuff in the news all the time these days. You know, what's the relationship between uh, the federal government and, and the various states, and you know where what what powers are reserved to the individual states, and and where can the federal government draw that line, and how can they interpret the Constitution? Uh, to support right. whatever agenda it might have uh, and various other things where the Supreme Court factors into all of this. Is the Supreme Court really kind of a de facto legislative body or is it, you know, what is it exactly and how does it function? And you see the the evolution of that. And what I particularly like about this book is that, well, it's not, this is the book that I was talking about that is, it's, it's, it's wonderfully written and it's a very, it's, it's an excellent book, but I, you know, it's a little bit dense. And so you have to read it slowly and you might have to look some things up a lot because it re- references things that I had to look up a number of times just to make sure that I was, you know, following, uh, following along. But it's, uh, if you can distill it down to, uh, to language that the general public can understand or students can understand, I think what they'll understand, what, what they'll find about this is that, you know, everything, you know, the, the, the branches of government are also dynamic institutions. You know, all of them and, and that they, they evolve and they change and over time and, you know, uh, and they respond to 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 big events. And, and and when they do all this kind of stuff, you know, there, there are going to be people who push back against that or, you know, uh, propose uh, uh, alternate paths. Uh, and this book is very interesting uh, when it when it comes to that sort of stuff. It, sees, it shows the fluidity of the federal government and its relationship with, uh, you know, with the people and, and with the states and the localities. So I, I think that that book. Uh, was quite good. Mm, that's awesome. I it's, uh, thank you, Barbara, in the chat <clears throat> for letting me know the keys number one choice was not on the list uh, on going across the bottom of the screen. That was oh, no. my fault, my oh, technical fault, but is. we got it on there now, so we okay, are ready good. to rock and roll there. Um, we have uh, I have an audible mention, and then one that I have yet to read that I would like to mention because it's a wild card one. Uh, mm-hmm. It's it's made my it would have made my list if I probably would have read it because it's just crazy. Uh, but, do, you, do you have that stack of books at, at your house too that it's like you know to be read? I have an entire shelf. It's like I kind of got to go yeah. down the list. Yeah, you know, I, I have uh, I have a stack of books here in the office, and I have two which are on the TV stand out there, and I'm mm-hmm. pulling two or three at a time from the TV stand, and then <laughs> yeah, I make my way down. Yeah, it's 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 crazy, <laughs> and they keep sending more. Please keep sending more. Yeah, uh, keep <laughs> you, know. I, you know, I I love it. I promise you, I will get to it. I promise. I mean, need to up the power on my reading glasses by the time I get to them, but yeah, I will get to it. Uh, one that is timely for uh, this time of year, and uh, I think a lot of people will enjoy it. A lot of you have heard about it. Uh, this would have been in the number four slot if we did top five. Uh, this is uh, Feeding Washington's Army, Ricardo mm-hmm. Herrera. Great book. If you're into logistics, you will love this book. And if you're into the uh, uh, the Revolutionary War period, Valley Forge, Winter Quarters, uh, Ricardo Herrera does a great job with this book. It's very readable. It's, it's again, it's, it's a quick read uh, right there. It has the big players in it as far as, obviously, you're going to have Washington and his staff, but also Anthony Wayne and mm-hmm. Nathaniel Green and how they impact the winter of uh, 1778 at Valley Forge and going out to actually forage uh, off of the landscape at the time and trying to get provisions to last through another winter. We often forget about these, as we were saying earlier with Sharpsburg, we often forget about how much these people live off the land and what they take and how it scars the land. You have these kind of movements into the landscape in the mid-Atlantic region where they are trying to survive for another few months Mm -hmm. as the army is disintegrating from cold and sickness and uh, lack of necessities. So uh, it's, it's, if you don't have a military history background, it might be a little bit of a challenge because of the idea of logistics and, and, and uh, forced marches and all these are terms that might, throw you off a little bit but 
a quick Google search and you'll get through that one uh, pretty well with those kind of terms. And I believe uh, I believe he puts the terminology in the front of the book. I'd have to look through it again. The one, though, that I would like to say I wish I would have gotten to in 2022. Mm -hmm. and I, this is on that pile mm -hmm. <laughs> out there mm -hmm. is uh, Jeremy Zalen's American Lucifer's The Dark History of Artificial Light. 1750 to 1865. Talk about a wild card. Yeah. But when they say everything about history has been written. No. <laughs> Dark history <laughs> <laughs> not even close yeah the dark history of artificial light i have to get through this because i'm just like this is gonna be a wild card for me especially mm -hmm. since it's 1750 to 1865 i have a feeling there's a lot of accidents in this and and other things <laughs> going on this is where we learn not to stick our finger into the yeah oh that's flammable i didn't know that <laughs> <laughs> you know so yeah that's going to be the that's going to be the one that uh that i'm going to read probably four books from now because <laughs> i'm in i'm into three right now so uh poll question who wins the top three list event 88 percent say keith takes takes the night tonight what can i say i'm two for three man you are you're that's you're, good. you're you're it two out that's of three good. it takes it very excited. Well, that, that's a this is a great honor, I have to say. Oh, oh it's great. You want to give a, a speech for your award? Yeah, yeah I wasn't <laughs> I was expecting to win, so I don't have anything prepared. I'm, I'm sorry. No, that's okay. That's okay. Yeah. No prepared remarks. Yeah. Uh, but no, the list is going across the bottom, everybody. And uh, we uh, we appreciate you stopping by. This is a great list, though. I really have to say, there's some yeah, there's someone here that I have. I've, written, I've written it down. I've uh, I've got your picks in here for the, for the ones that I haven't read, so I'm looking forward, especially the Gettysburg book uh, and the medical stuff. That seems really interesting yeah. to me. Yeah, and and it really is going to help maybe something when you uh, bring your kids back east. Precisely. Uh, yeah. You know, there might be a field hospital nearby that you can connect mm -hmm. with it or or something. Yeah, uh, and, I, and I use the Frasnito books, um, you know, mm -hmm. uh, pretty extensively looking at pictures. You know, the, the, the kids like to, you know, they go stand in the spots and they can they recreate the pictures and stuff. And, you know, but uh, so I've, I've, I've used those in the past. But this is going to be neat, too, if I can take kids to where, you know, here, an aid station was right here. And this is what went down in an aid station. I'll help them, you know, try to visualize that. Right. Yeah, there's there. Mm -hmm. I believe there's only one marked aid station on the battlefield. I did mm -hmm. a video from it. I think it's the only one um and that's a cool spot because it's not it's not behind the fence right now at like little round top or something so you right. can you that, go, that's you closed can, now for like another year isn't it another year yeah it's yeah. it's closed for another year um but they're they look like they're doing amazing work on it and mm -hmm. uh we'll, we'll see what see what it looks like when it's all said and done uh yeah. but but we'll we'll find out i guess next year sometime uh 24 i think right we'll find out 24. that's right uh matthew coiler what was the gettysburg one uh let me get in my pile <laughs> while books fly everywhere uh that was uh james gindles perger's bullets and bandages the aid stations and field hospitals at gettysburg <clears throat> fantastic book if you're into gettysburg history um or uh medical history i did i, I did an honorable mention to a medical book and i gave one <laughs> on my list i didn't realize that Been a lot of medical stuff lately apparently yeah so everybody thank you for joining us tonight keith thank you so much man it's been fun it has been fun it's always a pleasure to talk to you man always good to talk to you brother i appreciate mm -hmm. everything you've done everything you do and likewise and we'll do another one someday and i don't know what it'll be about but we'll figure it out <laughs> whatever man i'm always game yeah Everybody, thank you so much again for, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. This is one of our largest crowds so far for top yeah. three. So, hey, I appreciate each and every one of you for hanging out and voting in the polls and letting us know your thoughts in the chat. It really means a lot to us. Please take care of yourself. Be well. Keep reading. That's also for you, Keith, because we got to get through these piles. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and, uh, we'll, we'll talk with all of you very soon. Have a good night, everybody.